Let's start with a steadfast leader who is an icon of distinguished service to the Indian Navy, having been the naval advisor to various diplomatic missions. He was the former chairman of the National Maritime Foundation before taking over the reins as vice chief of naval staff. He served as the chief of staff at the headquarters of the Eastern Naval Command. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome an advisory board member of Ayman and the Chief of Indian Navy, Admiral Robin Kumar Dhawan. Welcome, sir. Sorry, our escort disappeared in the middle for some reason. Uh, it will never happen again. No need for the firing squad. All right. Uh, next up to join uh, us on stage is... A man who is true embodiment of the Air Force's motto, Touch the Sky with Glory. A man who is the war hero of 1971. The man who helped India liberate Bangladesh. And of course, we defeated Pakistan. Ha, ha, ha. Please welcome another advisory board member of the Ayman and the 22nd Chief of Indian Air Force, Air Chief Marshal Pradeep Vasan Nayak. Anyway. All right, it's uh, moving on to the third. A fantastic gentleman that we have here in the panel, clad in the armor of experience and adorned with the medals of honor. He is someone who has etched his name in history. He has been the chief of army staff during the Kargil War and has guided our country towards victory. He is the ultimate definition of a hero on and off the battlefield. To have him as advisor has been one of our greatest honors. So please welcome the hero of heroes, 19th chief of the Indian Army, General Ved Prakash Malik. Okay, uh, today is a great day for me to take Panga with someone in my colony because I got Army, Navy, Air Force here. <laughs> I think I can take care of anything. Uh, sirs, we'll start with a very serious question. They all want to know who's going to win the World Cup, uh, the October World Cup, which is in India, Cricket World Cup, and the answer is India. India, <laughs> India for sure. No way. <laughs> There's Second. no doubt, Cyrus. There's only one country that can win the World Cup, and that's India. Do you approve? We have only one guy from Germany who handles some of the accounts. That poor guy is alone, but uh, we'll talk to him later. Okay, now we've got some more uh, serious questions which we have been put together by Rishabh and Gang. Cyrus. Yes, sir. Voice is echoing a lot. Not getting voice is echoing? Yeah. But whatever I have to say, sir, is of no consequence. So you answer anything. <clears throat> okay, I'll try. Um, let's start with this again. Uh, let's start, sir, with uh, General, with you. Could you narrate one wartime story that you were a part of and lessons that you learned from that? Any personal wartime story of your own? That's a serious question. It's a serious question, but you can take it anywhere you want to and say whatever I, I, you want. I you're a general. We are all going to accept your answer. I, I didn't expect that serious question from you. And it's, you it's forced on us. <laughs> you know, I think um, when you are facing bullets, and when there is shelling going on around you, at that time, you only think of that particular moment. And uh, you don't have the time, you don't think of anything else. But um, I'm narrating to you an incident where as our army chief, uh, and in that senior position, you have more time to think of past, you have to time to think of the present, what is going on, and you also have to think of future. Uh, this is 22nd, 23rd of uh, May 99. Some people had uh, come and occupied a height on the Srinagar Kargil Highway and the reports given to us was that these were jihadis from Pakistan and uh, they were firing and they were stopping all the traffic which was going on on that road. 
So the local brigade commander, he told them, he sent a company, he said, go and get that place vacated and either kill them or capture them, whatever was possible. And uh, this particular company went and they could not reach the top because the firing became so heavy. And in fact, they suffered a lot of casualties. Then the next company was sent around about 25th or 26th of May. And at that time, they suffered even more casualties. The firing was going on, not only from the heavy machine guns and others, but also artillery firing also. And the intelligence reports were, these are jihadis. And that is the time we felt that these are not jihadis. The kind of weapon that they are using, the way they are firing, uh, and artillery firing is also going on. And so that was going on till about uh, 30th of May, I went there myself and uh, I saw and I decided to change the position, our command. And I put another formation there and I asked them to go but fully prepared. Uh, I was not the commander at that place, I was the army chief. So I was telling my commanders to be careful, go fully prepared. And uh, so ultimately we had to make use of two battalions. And uh, around about 9th or 10th the attack went with those two battalions. They reached near the top, almost about 25, 30 meters from the enemy. And for the next few days, they were not only firing at each other, they were even able to abuse each other. That was the state. And in the meantime, both sides were suffering casualties. And um, finally, we even we used the helicopter and one helicopter, armed helicopter, got shot. So that came as a shock to us also. They were able to make use of Stinger missiles. So by that time I was quite certain that these are not jihadis, these are Pakistan army people. That was convinced in my mind. So we used then, uh, not only higher weapons, we used buffers by that time. We managed to get them there. The fighting carried on till about 13th or 14th of June. And um, ultimately we were able to overcome the opposition. And uh, the attack went not only from the front, but also from the rear. So better tactics, better weapons, more people, we were able to capture Tololing. That was the name of the feature. and that turned out to be the turning point of that war, the first turning point. And um, I think I would say those are the most tense days of my career. Because now it was not only that I wasn't fighting, but I had all the responsibility on my shoulders. Uh, we lost three officers and about 20 odd Javans. We recovered about 27 dead bodies of Pakistanis, a large number of weapons and documents, which proved that they were only Pakistani army people, there were no jihadis amongst them. So that was, uh, I would say, perhaps the most tense period of my uh, professional career, in which all this, I went a couple of times in that area and I saw what was happening. I met the casualties also. So what lesson did we learn? As I said, it was a turning point. I found that our troops perhaps are the most courageous, the bravest of the lot, the so determined, the fighting spirit I noticed during that period of our Javans and our office, young officers. That convinced me that yes, we can overcome this. But the biggest lesson, I think, for both juniors as well as seniors was resilience. Our resilience at the level 
at all levels that yes, if you stick on to what you have been asked to do and you are doing it, you will overcome all kinds of opposition you will be. And that made me feel that yes, we will overcome this opposition and we will be able to win this war. So if you ask me, um, that was not only the most tense period of my professional career with all the responsibilities, but also a big lesson that I learned from our own army, from our own Air Force, people who were participating uh, during that period of almost about 20 days that I saw. Wow. What a story, General. Give him a big hand. <laughs> we're probably sitting here because, because the war went in, in our direction, thank God. It could have been much worse otherwise. Uh, it's amazing what he goes through, what they go through as real life heroes with physical assault and all the responsibility of our country and all the people under them. And my problem is uh, finding parking in Valkeshwar. But that's, that's the difference <laughs> in, in what you do in life. So a lot of respect. Uh, but I will ask a lighter question because I think Sir was uh, alluding to why he does, doesn't want serious questions. Sir, uh, who is your favorite actress of all time? Your favorite actress? Female actor. Favorite actress? Yes. No, actress. Either. Yes, yes, actress, sir. The, the uh, army question, the war question, you came uh, out very fast my with the answer. I'm <laughs> my generation, I was a great fan of Madhubala. Oh, wow. Everybody remembers Madhubala? Let's see. No, not bad. Either they're lying because they're scared of you guys, or they do know. Do you know Madhubala? Not bad. If you ask me today's generation, I would say Madhuri Dikshit. Ma <laughs> Madhuri they know. I don't want to take Panga uh, general, but technically she's also uh, 90s, 2000s. But okay, we'll accept it. Thank you, General. Let's move on to the next uh, slightly serious question, Air Chief Marshal, which is, uh, this is from Rishabh, our leader. The Ukraine, Russia, the war in Syria, numerous skirmishes in Africa, what is the role of multilateral organizations like the UN? It is evident that they are failing to maintain peace in light of this. How do you think India should view its participation in the global order? Wow, coming from Cyrus, this is a googly, yeah? Cyrus is reading. I don't know sir. I'm just reading. Yeah. Anyway, good evening to all of you. It's a pleasure uh, being here, uh, interacting with you all. We are talking about the UN and whether it is effective and whether India should continue to be a part of it. Yeah. Actually, we have a long history with UN. I'm sure all of you must have studied that. Ambassador Shah is already here. He is also a major contributor to the cause of India's presence in UN. 1942, I think India was one of the charter nations, 51 odd countries. Uh, League of Nations converted onto United Nations. Today, 190 or 193 or something like that countries are the members of UN. Now, the major criticism of United Nations today is that they are not good at conflict resolution. That is the main concern of everybody. It does a many, a lot of other good things that UN does, which generally don't come to light. You know, you have uh, UNESCO and you have UNCTAD and you have so many other organizations. You have the International Court of Justice, you have the International Monetary Fund. All these things are UN organizations and they do a fairly good job. India has participated for the last uh, 16 odd years as a non-permanent member of what they call the uh, Security Council. Permanent members are the top few who were there during the Second World War, after the Second World War. This is a slightly longer answer, so give me a little yes, bit sir. of time. Can you all hear me there? Okay. okay, okay. Madhubala, can you hear? Yeah, they can hear. Huh. Madhubala is actually sitting in the front row, that's my wife's name. Huh? Really? Okay. Yeah. Can she wave? Everybody wave. <laughs> Air Chief Marshal's wife is actually Madhuwala. Kya coincidence hai, sir? And we were both a pair at one time. I was Pradeep Kumar and Madhuwala, although I didn't like Pradeep Kumar at all. Wow. Ever. <laughs> She's hiding. <laughs> so anyway, conflict resolution 
uh, what you need is money and you need forces. The other thing a little skewed about the UN is the representation of the entire world. For the last 10 years or so, there has been a power shift. I'm sure all of you must have studied it at some time or the other. From the West coming on to the East, countries have become more powerful. Even Germany is not a permanent member of the Security Council. So India has been fighting uh, the case for a long, long time. In fact, in 2020, our Prime Minister Modi also gave a speech there saying that the entire uh, membership of UN, as far as the Security Council is concerned, needs to be revisited. Because many poor countries have now come up. Their economies are good, their uh, standard of living is good, and they deserve a better uh, seat at the UN. At present, there's an organization called the G4. I'm sure you must have heard of it. India is there, Brazil is there, Germany and Japan. These four countries are vying for a permanent seat. The other problem with UN, uh, before we come to participation, I'll just discuss one of the problems there, is misuse of the veto. Now, as you all are aware, these permanent five members have got the veto power. Veto has been used against us for a long period of time, many number of time, by China. One of the reasons was to deny us a seat on the permanent panel. They've used the veto. The second time they used the veto one way was when they wanted to declare that Paki terrorist as, a, uh, what is his name, I forgot, whatever. So anyway, that Paki terrorist, famous, I think some of you may know the name here. So they wanted to declare him as an international terrorist, red corner and all that, where China again put in their veto. Veto has been used for our good also. You know, during the 71 war, the veto has been used by Russia to prevent uh, American forces from coming there. So veto has both uh, sides, but veto has been misused quite a few times. So that is another problem. This next problem is money. United States is the main supplier of money and now China. So UN depends on their goodwill, so a lot of decisions go their way. India has contributed to the UN. They have contributed forces, it's contributed money, it's contributed missions. I've been personally to a mission in Congo, where we were Pakistanis, all of us were uh, doing the UN task. So a lot of uh, contributions have been there. We lost a few people, about 150 odd people have given their lives also in the service of the UN. So the question now is, should India back away or should you stay there? I think it is very important that India continues to be there and continues to fight for better representation of upcoming countries and continue, because that will be a good thing for all the developing nations. So in my opinion, I think India should continue to be there despite the many faults that UN has. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Big hand. We will stay in the UN as uh, we will take up the advice. And a uh, slightly lighter question for you as well is, uh, we have a huge problem in India at the moment come October 6th, and that's going to be number four position in the batting 11. Who do you recommend, sir, as our permanent number four position? In the batting 11, we have a problem in the 50 over format with the number four position after the end of Yuvraj Singh. We have not been able to get a consistent batsman at number four. Batsman? Yes, sir. So, oh. would you like KL Rahul, Shreyas Iyer? Would you like somebody new to come in like Tilak Raj? Who is your call for number four? I think Pant was a very good choice, but that idiot went and pranked. <laughs> Rinku Singh is my bet. You want Rinku Singh for 50 yeah. overs? As well as... Uh, Varma. Tilak. Mm. Tilak Varma. Tilak Varma. Yeah. I think yeah. these two boys are really good. Wow. General has gone for youth. Just like the military generally does, they are going for youth. Oldies, Shreyas and KL Rahul will have to get the bad news soon. But uh, Admiral Sir, sorry for keeping you here. I know you've been very patient. Uh, your question is not to do uh, really with uh, seafaring issues. But more importantly, again, Rishabh Ji has asked me to say this, so I will have to ask you, is there a possibility of a nuclear weapons-free world? Because now with this Russia-Ukraine thing and people worried about nuclear attack at some point, and it's, uh, you know, this Oppenheimer film in the background, is it possible 
to have a nuclear in reality free world i think a nuclear free world is only wishful thinking and is not going to happen because the road for a nuclear free world is very very long and bumpy and the reason for that is that it is the big powers which have armed themselves with so much arsenal as far as the nuclear weapons are concerned mm. and actually they have started misleading themselves by calling these nuclear weapons as weapons of peace and and they feel that somehow the nuclear weapons can bring peace to the world even the concepts such as deterrence concepts such as mutually assured destruction are being questioned time and again because what has happened is that while nuclear nations may act responsibly and make convey that we need to exercise restraint that we will have no first use etc the threat is from proliferation of nuclear weapons the threat is from nuclear weapons getting into the hands of non state actors the threat is from nuclear weapons getting into the hands of terrorists which is a reality today and believe me as long as there are nuclear weapons in existence they will be used some day by somebody somebody will use them if responsible nations may not use them a terrorist will use it non state actors will use it so yes uh, it's a pipe dream to have a nuclear free world not that attempts have not been made in the past countries like united states themselves Uh, when president obama was uh, there uh, they've talked of uh, nuclear disarmament uh, they've talked of uh, getting all these weapons under control but the first thing is to understand that big nations cannot just talk they have to walk the talk and actually take some action an action plan because 90% of the nuclear weapon arsenal is with the big powers so they have to make the beginning they cannot look at other people and say that you start cutting exactly. down nuclear weapons 90% of the weapons are with the united states are with russia are with china so these big powers have actually got to walk the talk they have to take the action and if they are serious about it they actually have to go in for total disarmament because there is nothing like a partial disarmament they have been talked in the past of no first use okay at least take the first step second you have to take off these major nuclear warheads from the high alert list you have to reduce the number of nuclear warheads which are deployed all over the world has anything of this sort been done no so while it is essential to have a or it's at least a dream to have a nuclear free world for our future generations which is sitting here uh, i think that the road is long and bumpy and it's not going to happen in a hurry and just for the record sir uh, so china russia us the stockpile is still there right they personally never removed anything even though the call is for disarmament nothing not only have they not reduced it they continue to be deployed nuclear arsenal today is deployed warheads are on an active and high alert list there is deployment of nuclear weapons and they have uh, nuclear triads which are ready to be deployed uh, from land from air and uh, underwater yeah that's amazing the call for disarmament but everybody's got their stockpile at home we don't have time to go into it in more detail but i'm sure the young minds here will start asking these questions of the so called larger powers but quickly sir uh, question like a question which is who is your favorite singer and a request from the team madhubala if you would maybe sing a little bit as well well uh, my favorite uh, singer would be uh, alka yagnik oh wow i think she is an amazing singer i, I think sir is asking how come huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's <a, laughs> she is an amazing singer yeah All right. Would you like to sing any of her songs? No, not at all. I dare ask twice. <laughs> <laughs>
powerful men on the stage. Thank you so much, uh, sirs. Please go back to your seats. Uh, you will each receive from Ayman 25 acres of land in South Mumbai. This is Rishabh's promise. Yeah, my pleasure, sir. Lovely listening to you.